us in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have gathered in God's presence as sinners needing forgiveness. We know that our old nature is sinful and that we have sinned against God and others with our thoughts, words, and actions. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God our Father, seeking His mercy and grace on account of Christ our Savior. Please kneel if you are able. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. God is merciful to us, and he has loved us with an everlasting love. He sent his Son into our world to redeem the world, so that all who trust in him are reconciled to the Father. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce this grace unto all of you. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand.
You may be seated. Thank you. Well, you get me for a children's message today, kids, so I'm sorry. I apologize from the very beginning. I am not Mrs. Jean. She is off. She got tired of the heat of Riverside and is off on an Alaskan cruise right now. It is against the commandments to covet, so I will not. <laughs> but we wish her God's uh, blessing with it. Her whole family's going together, so what a joy that is for, for her. Uh, kids, I want you to think about heroes. And a lot of times we talk about not just heroes, but superheroes. When I thought about that, I thought about these two superheroes. Maybe you have your own different superhero, but as a kid growing up, I really thought Superman was super and loved to put on a cape and fly off of my couch just like him. He was someone that I looked up to. And then there's, of course, Wonder Woman and, and, and the abilities that she has too. Uh, this morning in our readings, we're going to talk a little bit about superheroes. You know, heroes can be not just people that we read about or see in films, but can be actual real people that can give us great encouragement in our life. Maybe your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa is a superhero to you because of their life and their strong faith and character, and that's awesome. But you know, not just children, but we as adults, we need heroes too. The scriptures talk about that. The Bible talks about that, that we ought to have heroes that we can imitate, heroes of faith. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at one of those heroes of faith, and his name is St. Stephen. And I really like him because I think his name is pretty cool. <laughs> And he's a hero because even though a lot of people criticized him, he stood strong and boldly for Jesus. He would not let peer pressure change his confession or his life, but he lived, and we'll find out, he died for Jesus. My encouragement to you kids is to find a Bible hero. And I think that's good for us adults too. A hero in scripture that we can look to and be encouraged and inspired by and imitate. St. Paul talked about it that way too. He says, imitate me. So you might have Superman or Wonder Woman or someone like that as your superhero and that's good. But I would encourage you to find a superhero in the Bible too that can give you encouragement that you want to become just like when you grow up. And maybe even that hero might be St. Stephen. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, thank you for the heroes in our life. The heroes in stories and movies that help us to uh, want to be better, but also the real heroes that you've given to us, our parents and our grandparents, and the heroes of the Bible, O oh Lord. Let them be an inspiration to us so that in our lives, we might serve strongly our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, for those children that are going to be attending Sunday school, thanks to Kelly Sippen, who's leading Sunday school today. We'll let you go out the back and have a great time in the Lord. readings today focus on two martyrdoms. In Acts, we see the stoning of Stephen. He spoke out against the religious leaders by proclaiming that true worship of God is not in a particular temple or place, but in faith through Christ alone. Likewise, our gospel readings records the death of John the baptizer. He too pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God who alone can take away the sin of the world. While Christian martyrdom is tragic, all who die clinging to the greater death and resurrection of Jesus Christ die in peace and gain eternal life. A reading from the book of Acts, the seventh chapter. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. 
The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia and before he lived in Haran. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now portrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these mir miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like, the one, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I'll give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. 
When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ.
I'm Stephen. And I hold a unique place among all the saints of the New Testament. I was one of the first deacons appointed to the church, and more importantly, I am the first Christian martyr. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As a boy, I was raised as a Greek Jew. Now, Greek Jews are Jews who speak Greek and attend a synagogue conducted in Greek. You see, my family was not originally from Israel, but had immigrated from another part of the Roman Empire. Because of this, my family not only picked up the Greek language, we sort of picked up the Greek culture as well. So even though I'm a Jew, my Greek language and my Greek culture always made me feel, well, a little bit like an outsider. I felt this way because there's also Aramaic-speaking Jews. The Aramaic-speaking Jews attend a synagogue where the service is conducted in Hebrew. These are Jews born in Palestine. Jesus himself spoke Aramaic, as did the 12 disciples, and they worshipped in Hebrew. So you can see how that they felt they were the true Jewish Christians. They spoke the same language as Jesus and lived in the place where he conducted his public ministry. Now, in the early church, one of the first issues that arose stemmed from this tension between these two groups. Some of our widows, who were Greek Jews, were being overlooked, and much of the charity was being given to the Aramaic widows instead. We felt as if there was a bias against us. Now, the apostles were completely overwhelmed at this point. The church had grown by thousands, and they were constantly preaching and teaching and baptizing. At the end of the day, they didn't have the time or the energy to oversee the charitable outreach of the church. So they decided to form a church committee. They appointed seven men to govern these affairs. And in their wisdom, the apostles decided to choose all Greek-speaking Jews. That is, those of the minority, of which I was one. All the men picked were of honorable reputation and could be completely trusted. Now, I saw it as an absolute privilege to serve in the church, and I did so with a great deal of enthusiasm. I was a Christian on fire for Christ. As I listened to the apostles' teaching, the Holy Spirit bolstered my faith, and I was able to do miraculous things for the needy. I give all the credit and the glory to my Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't long, though, before my faith was tested. The temple courts were always a place where theological issues were debated. And I find myself in the midst of a very heated argument. I was arguing with some of the members from the synagogue of freed men. Now, these were Greek Jews like myself, but they were once Roman slaves who had earned their freedom. I knew the Bible like the back of my hand, and by the Spirit's wisdom, I continued to show them their errors. They got so angry at me that they traipsed me before the high priest to testify to him. Basically, the question came down to this. Is Jesus all you need for salvation? Now, some of these other Jews thought Jesus was great, but that you still need the temple sacrifices and other rituals to truly be saved. In other words, they were saying that you need Jesus plus something else. Does that sound at all familiar with the spirituality of your age? Isn't works righteousness something that the church still needs to confront in your day? Well, I like to think of myself as a pretty level-headed guy most of the time, but when it comes to the gospel, the core of Christianity, I was not going to give an inch. There are certain things that are non-negotiable, and this was one of them. I pointed to the beauty of their temple and all the people worshiping there, and I said, 
you don't need any of this. The Most High God does not live in houses made by human hands. As far as I'm concerned, you can tear down this whole temple, that there's not one stone left upon another, and it wouldn't affect my faith at all. Now I knew where all this was going. Because they couldn't argue with me from Scripture, they were trying to find a way to get rid of me. It actually, it actually broke my heart because their salvation had appeared in Christ and yet they kept on living their old lives. But I wasn't going down without a fight. I gave it one last attempt to show them the serious errors of their ways. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who received the law that was given through the angels but have not obeyed it. Now when you speak the law in its full force and it hits you smack between the eyes, there are only two ways that you can respond. You will either see the errors of your way and repent or you will dig in, become angry and rebel. When the Jewish leaders heard what I had to say, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at me. Now what came next was something so surreal that I didn't fully realize what was happening until it was almost over. They rushed me, they grabbed me, a hold of me, and they dragged me outside the city gates. There they picked up stones and began to hurl them at me. Stone after stone, after stone, after stone pelted my body and my head. The pain was excruciating and I knew that I did not have much more time on this earth. By the grace of God, the Lord gave me a vision to encourage me. Now, I know that some have claimed in a near-death experience to sort of see some bright light. But what I saw, I saw heaven opened up and the glory of God shining all about and my Lord Jesus was there to take me home. His love and grace for me gave me strength to imitate him in my own death. Like Jesus, I, I prayed for my enemies, Father, forgive them. And before I lost consciousness, I prayed as Jesus did, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, Holy Scripture records my death with these words. When he said this, he fell asleep. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Falling asleep is one of the joys in life. In the midst of this gruesome scene and horrible death, I fell asleep in the Lord. He did not forsake me. And just as wonderful it is to go to sleep at the end of a long day, so beautiful was my death, for I was about to wake up on the other side of eternal life. So what am I doing here now? What is my saint story being told to you today? What do you have to learn from me, you who are learning to become the church and serving one another like deacons? Well, the first is this, that the Christian life involves sacrifice. After all, that's what Jesus did for us. He left his rightful throne and he humbled himself. No, no, he humiliated himself to become like one of us. His love for you and me took him to the cross where his death was far worse than mine. 
Mine was over in mere minutes. He hung dying for hours. And what's more, he carried the weight of your sin and my sin on his shoulders and suffered the punishment of God the Father. And all this, all this was for us who were slaves to sin, but now by the grace of God have been made freed men. Oh, that's why I couldn't compromise on the gospel of Jesus Christ. His blood alone avails for us, and in him we are forgiven and declared righteous by God. But with your rejoicing also comes a call to lay down your own life. You too are called to be martyrs if you are a true believer in Jesus. St. Paul wrote to the church in Colossae these words, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And so, whether it's your greed or your lust or your drive to be accepted, put it to death. If your neighbors or workmates or classmates ridicule Christians, then be willing to put your popularity to death. If your thirst for material things keeps you from tithing the blessings God has given you, then starve your consumerism to death. If you'd rather sleep in on a Sunday morning, then put your laziness to death. This should be your goal, to put your flesh to death and then live by the grace of God as a new creation. And if it isn't, then you have the wrong goal. If you really want to follow Jesus like I followed Jesus, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to die. Now, more than likely, I'm not talking about a literal martyrdom, but it does involve dying. Make no mistake about that. Unless you have found something worth dying for, then you aren't truly living. Dear Christian friends, are you truly living in Christ? The second thing that you can learn from me is equally difficult. If you are in Christ, then you are to call to forgive your enemies. God was merciful and gracious to us while we were still sinners. And that's why he teaches us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now I know that's not an easy thing to do. Forgiving others can be just as difficult as dying to yourself. But there is great healing in it. You see, when you live with anger in your heart, it eats you up inside. Your heart decays a little bit every day from the poison of resentment and jealousy. It is in forgiveness that you find release. When you forgive, you cross over from the realm of law and death into the wonderful world of grace and life. Whom do you need to forgive? Wouldn't it be nice for you to enter this new week without carrying that emotional baggage? What are you holding on to it for? Let it go and let God bring healing into your life. Now you might say to yourself, but I have a right to retaliate. And under the law, you might very well have a right. But look to our precious Lord on the cross. He had every right to take himself down from it. He is holy and without sin. But what does he say from the cross instead? Father, forgive them. Christ died to win us forgiveness. And so by the grace of God, I was able to pray that prayer of Jesus as my enemies were stoning me to death. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And do you know that God performed a great miracle in answering my prayer? At my murder, a guy named Saul was there. You know him as St. Paul. But before he became a disciple of Jesus, he was a violent enemy of the church. He gave his full approval of my stoning. But thanks be to God, 
that he not only forgave Saul for my death, but lifted him up to be a powerful missionary for Christ. Just think what God might be able to do in the lives of the people that you forgive. Before I let you go, let me teach you yet a third thing. Heaven is amazing. In heaven, in heaven there's nothing but the glory of God. There's no more sorrow and no more pain. There's no more need for forgiveness because there's no more sin. It is amazing. Some of you this morning might be saddened and burdened with a heart that mourns the loss of a loved one who has fallen asleep. Let me assure you, your loved one is okay. Uh, they're more than okay. They are terrific. Like me, they too have seen the Son of God seated at the right hand of the Father. And whether theirs was a peaceful death or like mine, a tragic death, Nothing on this earth can compare with the glory of heaven. Nothing. No thing. So banish all sadness in your heart and, and let there be gladness. For soon and very soon you will be with them and with me in the very presence of God. So this is my story. I am Stephen. My name means the crowned one, for I have finished my race and have been given the crown of eternal life. And in that sense, you too are Stephen or Stephanie, for in your baptism you have received a crown of eternal grace. So may your hearts be greatly encouraged so that by faith you may learn to die to yourself to forgive others who have wronged you, and most of all, to look forward to the hope that is yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even eternal life. Amen.
please join me in reciting the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of gods, light of lights, very God, very God, begotten of me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no man. Believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of liver and life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped or glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one Christian church, apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Lord, who walks with his saints, give us peace and courage to preach the gospel in all circumstances in our words and actions. Shape and mold us to be your church, holy and blameless, that we may walk in your ways. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God of heaven and earth, grant us love for your word, that like Saint Stephen, we may show that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever from the testimony of the Old Testament to the witness of the New Testament. Let us gladly hear your word, in, inwardly digest it, and embody it every day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, who relishes in being generous to his saints, you graciously bless us with all good things to sustain our daily life. Use the tithes and offerings for the sake of the mission of your church, that others may come to saving faith. Your people be sustained and grow in love toward you and toward one another, that we may care for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, who is Lord over all, you give authority to our civil leaders for the sake of the community. Guide those who have been charged with the safety, well-being, and overall good of our nation and community, that we may live peaceable lives in accordance to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, who hears the cries of your saints, be with those who are beset by troubles of body, mind, and soul. Just as you did not abandon Stephen, so too watch over those who are sick, suffering, mourning, or are in distress. Especially we ask for your watch care over our public servants. We lift up to you Chris Strike for the passing of her sister Phyllis Malcolm. We ask for comfort for her, Lord. We lift up to you Opal Hendershot. We ask that you be with her and the doctors during her knee surgery tomorrow. Lord, we lift up to you Mike Gibson, our district president, as he is recovering from his surgery as well. Lord, we ask for all those in Houston and other places where they are suffering, such as the, the Bailey's daughter, Tracy. We ask, Lord, that you will be with them during the heat and the lack of electricity. O oh Lord, who is always present in times of every trouble, today you promise to be with us in the sacrament of the altar. May all who come and eat the fruits of your cross find your complete forgiveness rest from their burdens, a family joined together, and a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord, we give you thanks for all you have completed 
for all who have completed their course in life through steadfast faith. We thank you for the martyrs who did not succumb in their faith even when it took their very life. Help our unbelief that we too may stand in the day when our life may be taken away because the world hates you. May our life and our death be praised to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements for you uh, that you can see in the back of your bulletin. You know, July is sort of, you know, summertime as you're taking vacations and the like too. We're trying to catch our breath uh, in the church and in our school. And so uh, there are uh, not as many happening as they normally are. And that's a good thing. We too need Sabbath rest. But I want to highlight on page 15 the ordination of a son of our congregation, uh, Avery Juhlberg. That'll be happening two weeks from today on the 28th. Uh, of July, that Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, that will be a great day uh, for our church as we celebrate that God has raised up from our midst another pastor to serve in his church. And so uh, we, we'd invite you to be a part of that as well. The rest of the announcement uh, highlights some of our Bible studies that continue during the summer and ways that you can serve our foster kids as well. And so we'd invite you to participate in those things. Well, now we prepare our hearts for the service of the sacraments, and I would ask you to please stand again as our service continues on page 8. <laughs> 